Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this special Zoom call. It's a little bit different than what we've done in the past, but we're excited anyways. Today, we have Dr. Lionel Cruz, who is an associate professor of physics at the University of Tennessee at Martin. And we also have joining us Russell Orr, who is an education specialist here at Discovery Park of America. So thank you both for joining us today. Well, glad, to have, glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Awesome. And we are going to be talking about things that are in the night sky, specifically taurids. So, Dr. Cruz, do you want to give us a little overview of what exactly taurids are? Well, taurids are a meteor shower. Um, there's a number of meteor showers that we have over the year, um, and some of them are a little more impressive than others, and so they have names. Um, and this particular one is the, it's sort of focused, it's radiant as they call it, that's where the, the meteors appear to be coming from, are in the constellation of Taurus. And so that's, that's what gives it its name. So uh, the, the Taurids are actually divided into two main showers that are happening around this time. There's some other ones that, there's like another Taurid shower that's in like February, um, but there's two main ones that are occurring about right now uh, called the Southern and the nor Northern Taurids. Very good. Russell, do you have anything to add? Um, I, 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 I do have something to add. Um, I know that, um, that uh, a lot of these meteor showers are from different objects that, that like, where like chunks broke off as it was orbiting the sun, you know, hurtling through the solar system. Um, I, I remember that the Orionids were from Halley's Comet. Oh, what what object causes the torrids, and is there a different object for different showers, or is it uh, the same object causing two showers? It's the same object. It's called the uh, um, the comet is called Inky, E uh, E N C K E. Um, it might be pronounced a slightly different way. It's like Halley's. You can say Haley or Halley's. You know, there's different ways of saying it. Um, and it's actually the official name is two P slash Inky. Now, what that 2P means is it's the second periodic comet ever discovered. Halley was the first, so it's 1P Halley. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the two, you know, second P is for periodic. So it was actually discovered like way back in the late 1700s, um, uh, sort of officially discovered um, by, a guy, by a guy called Machin, uh, a French astronomer. And, but over the course of the, the next couple of decades, Different people saw it, but it, was, it wasn't until uh, the early 1800s where an astronomer named Inky actually calculated its orbit and exactly showed uh, that it was a, uh, an orbiting comet, uh, cometary object. And so that's how it gets its name. Uh, which the funny thing is, it's actually unusual. Comets are the only objects that the person who discovers it, it allow, is allowed to name it after themselves. All other objects have official naming procedures through the International Astronomers Union. But a comet you can name after yourself if you find it. Inky is actually one of the few that's actually named not by its discoverer, but by its mathematician that figured out its orbit. So it's kind of unusual in that regard. So do you think that there are comets that we could still discover and it be named after Katie Jarvis comet or Jarvis comet or Cruz comet? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, there was a, a famous comet in the late 90s called Hayukataki. It was a really, really bright, easy to see comet. It was actually discovered um, by an astronomer who, the interesting thing is he used old spy binoculars from Russia that when, when the Soviet Union collapsed, they, you know, there are these huge tripod mounted binoculars that they had, they had put all along the Chinese border to spy on the Chinese. Uh -huh. And they sold them all off and he got one of those and he used that to find comets. Oh my gosh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Now, the one, the one bad thing right now is that um, satellites are, you know, there's a ton of satellites out there photographing the sky. And actually, the satellite that's been looking at the sun for the past couple of decades, called SOHO, it's actually found like twice as many comets in its 20 years than were found by humans over the last 200 years. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, there's satellites out there finding them all the time. It makes it a little harder for us regular old jokes. to get to work. To find new ones. <laughs> yeah, we do, Russell. <laughs> So back to the torrids, mm -hmm. when is the best time, the date and all of that, the time of during the night, during the early, early hours of the morning to actually see these torrids, these meteorite showers? 
Yeah. Uh, well, of course, anytime you want to answer one too, Russ, I'll jump in. I, I don't want to take all the, t all the time. I don't know this one. You go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay, sure. Yeah. Um, it's, it, so there's, it's called the Northern and the Southern Torrids. The, so, the Southern one is um, uh, coming up. It's on overnight between October 29th and 30th. Okay. So um, the, uh, let me set up here a second. The, um, and really it's, it's kind of going to be visible most of the night. So uh, I, I got a thing, a thing I'll show you in just a minute where you can see it in, in just a second. Um, but it's the overnight, October 29th, 30th, the, the peak is really a wide peak. It's not like some meteor showers where it's, there's a few meteors for a couple of days and then it just really ramps up at a particular time. The torrids are kind of low numbers for you know, several weeks and they get a little bit higher over that night. Um, the the uh, northern torrids is actually the overnight between November 10th and 11th. Okay, so a couple weeks later, a week and a half later. Why are they called the northern, northern and southern torrids? Uh, one's a little bit higher in the sky than the other. Oh, that's <laughs> weird. It, it. Yeah, it's it's, right, it's kind of random. I mean, it's not really that much either. Uh, when again, when I show you, I have a diagram. I'll show you of where they the radiant kind of is, um, and it's not really that much different. So um, now, one thing I will say is the. Um, the, the the southern torrids, which are coming up now, there's actually a full moon that night. Ooh. So and that that makes it harder to see meteors. All right. Now now fortunately the torrids are, tend to be kind of bright. Um, but the the good thing about the the northern torrids later is it's actually going to be a crescent moon, so it'll be a little easier to see. Uh, that was, that was going to be my next question, and you could answer it, or Russell, you might know too. So I live in the city where there's a lot of light pollution. So where do I need to go to actually see? these torrids? Hmm. Well, you certainly don't want to go on like private property, but this is why some of the observatories that you, you hear about are in the middle of nowhere and you have to drive and drive and drive to get to them because they want it as dark as possible. But uh, clearly, like Dr. Cruz was saying, depending on which meteor shower you're watching, the brighter it is, the closer you can be to a bright light source to do it. But whatever you do, don't like look at your phone or like uh, look into a bright light while you're doing it. It'll take your eyes a long time to adjust back and be able to see them again. Will we be able to see them here in West Tennessee or do we have to be somewhere halfway across the world or? No, you can see them anywhere, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any, any, anybody that's, um, it's nighttime, uh -huh. you can see them. Very neat, just like the moon. Because yeah, you exactly. can see the moon around the, around the world. Very cool. Okay, so um, Dr. Cruz, do you want to show us that diagram of what part of the sky we, people should be looking at um, to see these, these uh, meteorite showers, the torrids? Sure, I got a couple of different things I can share. Um, so first, first, actually, just let me show you a diagram of it. Let me get that up real quick. It always takes just a second. Even <laughs> I've, I've kind of gotten to be a little bit of a pro at using Zoom for my classes. Oh, yeah. Sometimes it takes me a second to, to get things to share. Um, so here's an actual diagram of where they are in the constellation. Okay. Mm. Uh, and I'll show you a, a wider view of, um, of the, uh, what the night sky will look like on those nights. But this is the constellation of Taurus, right? So uh, I'll talk a little bit about what that is in a minute, or I guess I can talk about it right now. Uh, Taurus um, has several distinguishing features. Um, one, it has this thing called the Pleiades, which is a cluster. And I have a lot of people that will tell me they think that's the Little Dipper, but it's actually much smaller than the Little Dipper. But it looks kind of like you can sort of see it's a Little Dipper shape mm -hmm. sort of to it. Um, and it, it's fuzzy, it really stands out. Um, and it's actually a cluster of stars that all form together. Um, if you watch our last video we talked about. Mm -hmm. I, thought, I thought that sounded familiar. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it, so it, it's really easy to spot and you can see the radiance are gonna be right near it. Another thing that's easy to spot about Taurus is this sort of V shape. This is the head of the bull, right? So Taurus is the bull. And this is the eye of the bull, Aldebaran. It's, it's a very red, it's a red giant star. So it's really easy to spot. Um, and so if you see that sort of, fuzzy cluster, little dippery looking thing. And then just beneath it, you see a V shape, you found Taurus. And then the, the radiants are right next to the Pleiades. Now, let me mention real quick, a radiant is basically where the meteors appear to be coming from. So it's like lines shooting out from that center point, exactly. 
So they won't actually start there. They could start, you know, halfway across the sky even, but they'll look like they're traveling from that point. Most of them though will be close to this point in the sky, okay? So, um, and again, the, the, where the radiant is basically coming from, and we could talk a little bit more about the science of it in just a minute, but the radiant is basically, there's this stream of particles in space. And when the earth passes through that stream of particles, that's when you get the meteors appearing. And so, so they look like they're coming from a direction in space because that's, there's a stream of them that we're passing through a line of them in space. And so they, they appear to come from a point. So that, that was one thing I was wanting to, wanting to show you guys real quick. Let me see if I can get the other thing. Um, hope that wasn't too abrupt. No, not okay. at all. All right, let me pull this up. Okay, this is, um, this is a program called Starry Night. Um, I use this in like my labs in, at school. It's called planetarium software because it, it basically just simulates the night sky. And it's got, you can see all, all kinds of controls and things you can do to, uh, to manipulate the sky. So this is a, uh, a fake, like if it was right now, right? If you were standing, you can see it's uh, about where I am right now in Martin. And uh, if, if there happened to be mountains. <laughs> <they're> Martin. <laughs> in Martin and middle. <laughs> it's, a fake, it's a fake horizon. They, they just put that just, just, just to be pretty. And of course, here's the sun. So what I need to do is I need to advance it to nighttime. So let me advance it to about uh, 9 p.m. So let's just say 9.30 p.m. So this is what it would look like 9.30 tonight without the mountains. Um, and so this is looking south. And so what I can do is I can go toward the east and you can see this. You oh, see I pulse. see it. Yeah. Oh, I see the cluster too. And there's the cluster of the Pleiades up here. So I'm, I'm trying to hover over things because you can see it'll like give us all this information that'll get in the way. Um, but here's the head of the bowl, the V shape <clears throat> with Aldebaran, the, the eye, and here's the Pleiades. Now, of course, this is tonight. So let me actually go ahead a few nights to um, the night of the peak. <clears throat> and here you'll see, here's that full moon, right? Okay. So it's actually going to be really close which is another kind of bad thing. It's gonna, it's gonna wash out the fainter meteorites. Again, it's nice, the torrids are actually fairly bright. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about fireballs in just a second. <clears throat> but it's, uh, um, so they should be easy to see, but here's, here's the moon and actually here's Mars right up here. So one really cool thing, not only will you be seeing hopefully some good meteors, um, you, you'll actually have the moon and Mars like right next to each other in the sky, which is kind of neat. Wow, lots of activity happening next mm -hmm. weekend <laughs> in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> So, so again, this is what it'll look like. Um, incidentally, another one you can look for, there's a really bright star called Capella. It's actually the fifth brightest star in the sky. It's in that same general region, okay? And then if you do stay up later at night, so let me go forward till about midnight here. Um, another another uh, star will, I mean, another constellation will pop up. Here's Orion. Can you guys see the belt of Orion here? Mm -hmm. And then here's that box with Betelgeuse, the bright red supergiant and Rigel. And then the brightest star in the sky, Sirius, down here. Okay, so again, this area of the sky where the 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 radiant of the meteors are is you know is very easy to spot. You got Orion, you got Sirius, the super bright star. You're gonna have the Moon and Mercury. So kind of and that, that that cluster, it should be really easy to find. But unless you get unless you start too early, that's happened to to me before, where I was like, oh yeah, try, time to find Orion, and I was like. What am I doing wrong here? And I was walking around. Maybe it's behind these trees or behind these buildings. And it turned out I just started too early, and it was behind the Earth still. Yeah. Unfortunate. Unfortunate. If you'll let me digress for just one second, yeah. one of the things that I love, being an astronomer, this is kind of a sentimental thing for me. Early evening, around 9 p.m., Sirius will start to rise above the horizon around the beginning of winter. So for me. Um, that's sort of like winter is here when I can start to see Sirius in the early evening um, rising off the horizon. It's kind of like this this herald of winter that's coming. So I don't know if that's a sentimental that's really, thing for me. That's yeah. really neat. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Like so I noticed, I don't know if this has anything to do with it or my screen might just be dirty, but it looks like there's like a little dust on. Do you see that? Or it might just be my screen. <laughs> it's where oh, your oh, mouse oh. is. You're talking yeah, about right through here? Yeah, yeah that, that's actually the Milky, the Milky Way. Oh, okay. Very cool. So yeah, the Milky Way is coming up through this general area. Okay. Uh, now, 
unless you happen to be in a dark location, like on, on your, you know, your grandparents' farm or, you know, where, wherever that happens to be, you're not going to see the Milky Way. Okay. So, so I, I noticed that right here, we're looking at October 30th, which is the time of the Southern Taurids. So could we fast forward or go into the future a little bit to that November 10th sure. and see if we could see the, um, the Northern Taurids? Yep. It's going to be almost the same. Okay. We'll actually just have shifted a little bit more toward the West. Okay. But as the Earth orbits the sun, everything sort of slightly shifts across the sky. Okay. Um, now, you also notice that we do have a crescent moon. I was about to say, I don't see the moon high and bright anymore. So it'll, it'll be out of the way, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when we're searching for the towards in the sky, and, um, the weekend of Halloween and then the following weekend, can we see, does a telescope help spot these or anything like that? Do you want to take this one up, Russell? Uh, the, the telescope would, might very well make things worse. Uh, the, remember, the, the, the torrents will start at a certain point, but they're going to appear coming all different directions. So uh, if you go uh, looking for a, during a meteor shower, you want to look at the entire sky all at once, if you possibly can. Yeah. Now, I, I can even give you a sort of example of that. Here's the same program. If I were to zoom in for the, the sort of typical view from a, a, a telescope, let me, let me get all the way down to it. Oh, that's beautiful. Sorry, I know that's not your point. Wow. This is about what you'd be seeing. Just this really tiny sliver of the sky. So if a meteor just happens to go through that little tiny sliver of the so sky, what you would see is, and then it's gone. You wouldn't even see the whole meteor. Oh, wow. So, yeah, telescopes are bad. Binoculars, no need. Just get a lawn chair, get yourself comfortable, and watch. Oh, that's amazing. I'm excited to do that. So um, I have another question for you. So if somebody wants to watch a meteorite shower or meteor shower, but they can't watch the upcoming ones, when is the next, um, ne the next meteorite shower going to happen? Um, so which one should they try to see? Do you want to take this one, Russell, or do you want me to? Or? Uh, I, oh, I had a different question I was going to ask. I know that the, 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 Perseids or something are coming up, but I, I do know that like it, it seems like every couple of weeks there's another meteor shower starting from somewhere. So this it, this is like a really good hobby because you almost can't mess it up. You know, if you've got all your stuff, you put, pack them in your trunk, and then you're like, oh no, it's pouring down rain. Just wait, just yeah, wait. Yeah. It's it's fine. Just Google meteor showers in and then the month that you're coming up next to and you'll find one there are plenty of different uh, things flying through the sky that uh, will eventually hit the atmosphere of the earth and you'll be able to see don't worry about it. you'll 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 put that stuff to use eventually don't worry <laughs> I, I say absolutely and uh, uh, the in fact the next one after the northern torrids is the leonids there we go um, and it's uh, the night of November 16th 17th mm -hmm. now one of the issues about the Leonids is they, they have a very sharp peak. So the, the, there'll be sort of occasional meteor coming through the sky for a few days before and a few days after the peak. But the really best time to look at it is that night, and it's about 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so <laughs> you got to be dedicated if you want to see, uh, see these. But the Leonids, are, for, for one, their, their peak will be a lot more. Like they can be anywhere from, you know, like 50 to 100 meteors in that hour mm -hmm. during the peak. Plus, they tend to produce a lot of fireballs. Mm -hmm. right? Oh, yeah, we need to talk about the fireballs. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> a, a fireball is just basically an, an, an especially bright meteor. Most meteors are actually created by microscopic, like little bits of, you know, dust or something in, in outer space. When that hits our atmosphere, that material will actually... Um, the air in front of it will actually ignite as it moves quickly through the atmosphere. So what you're seeing when you're seeing a meteor is actually burning air in front of the meteor as it, as it sort of slams through the atmosphere. Wow. Um, fireballs are typically formed by larger things like pebble-sized or rock-sized objects. So oh. if a particular debris field has bigger objects in general, then that's when you'll see the much brighter, um, <clears throat> much uh, more pronounced, what are called fireballs. And they're called fireballs for several reasons. One, they'll actually leave a visible smoke trail. 
So you'll actually be able to see this for, for just a few minutes or so, or sometimes just a few seconds, this little trail of smoke behind the meteor after it passes. The other thing about it is, well, for one, they'll get really bright. Um, in fact, Torrid, uh, I think it was not the last one, but in the mid 2000s, there was actually a Torrid uh, meteor that got brighter than the moon. Wow. Super bright as it went across. How big an object would be required to be brighter than the moon? I mean, we talk about little bitty, so yeah. the size of a baseball, something. Yeah, about a, you know, sort of typical, you think of a rock, right? Maybe okay. a, you know, a baseball, softball. Um, the, um, the other cool thing about fireballs is these things are moving very quickly, right? We're, we're meteors, the meteoroids that we are hitting are moving at like 10, 20 kilometers per second or more. Um, so they're moving very rapidly. So you get these sonic booms, just like a, you know, a, a fighter craft going through. Oh. Uh, right. And so occasionally what you'll be able to hear, they, they, I've never actually heard it. I heard they, they, they say you can hear the sound of distant cannons, like cannon fire in the oh, distance. Like, well, like there's I've a, like, heard them, yeah. but it didn't sound like a cannon. It sounded like... Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Well, we were out in the middle of... I thought that I was imagining it at first, of, of course, but they were big and bright and had this green tint. And, yeah. and once there was a big one, every once in a while... You could hear it, but you know we might have been very far away from it, so we didn't hear it as a boom. But I, I do remember hearing them for sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and and that's a, and that's actually a great point, Russell. The really big ones, yeah, you can get all sorts of colors. Because I don't know if you in middle school, hopefully most of you have done this, where you can take like a, a Bunsen burner, a flame, and you put things on top of it, and they glow different colors. Same basic thing is happening here. The chemical composition of these meteors can be uh, meteor meteoroids, as they're called, can be different things, and so you can get actually different colors from them. Awesome, oh. Dr. Cruz, do, do you need to show us anything else on your screen share? Oh no, no, I'll I'll okay. I'll, I'll stop this. I okay. do want to mention mention that this again. This program is called Starry Night. <clears throat> you can go online and, and buy it if you want. It's not super cheap. There there are actually free ones online too. One's called Stellarium. But if you want something that's got a little bit more power, a little bit more customizability, Starry Night is actually one of these sort of industry standards. It's, okay. it's all over the place. You, awesome. you, can buy, you can buy home versions all the way up to versions that can actually control an observatory, like move the dome and the telescope and, and take pictures. And it can like control the whole thing for you. So. Neat. Well, thank you. you. Yeah, I'll stop sharing that. So we can get back okay. <laughs> well, thank you all for everything. I do have another question. And either one of you can answer. So here at Discovery Park upstairs in our uh, science, space, and technology gallery, we have a big meteorite on display. So would you, um, either one of you like to talk about that? And yeah, how did it get here? Where did it come from? I can absolutely tell you about that meteorite. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. Uh, it fell in the year 1516 AD, so about 500 years ago. Um, it fell in the country of China and believe it or not, they actually wrote down what it looked like the night it fell. Uh, it's very compelling to read. The record still survives. And Discovery Park has one of the biggest pieces of that meteorite. Uh, I think that the biggest one is in a museum somewhere in Japan. Um, and the, the other th one thing that I want to make sure to cover is that folks who've heard us use different words for these rocks from space, um, that all depends on where the rock is when you're observing it. Uh, Dr. Cruz, you know, talked about meteoroids and meteors, and I'm talking about meteorites. Uh, the difference is a meteorite is what happens if you find it and it actually survives going down uh, and hitting our planet. That's a meteorite. A meteor may or may not become a meteorite. It might not survive that journey through our atmosphere at extremely high speed. Well, thank you so much. And yesterday, I was actually walking around the museum giving a tour, and somebody showed me that um, that we've got some magnets and that it's a magnetic thing. So I had no idea. I've been working here for a long time, and I had no idea that it was magnetic. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. It's iron. Iron's actually pretty common in space. Oh. Uh, there are several different uh, metals that are uh, paramagnetic that are attracted to magnets, and uh, the meteorite's one of them. Uh, I would assume that in some cases, when they want to identify whether something is a meteorite, they would use a magnet at some step in the process. Is that correct, Dr. Cruz? Certainly. It's, it's an easy test. 
um, to do, um, of course, to confirm it, you got to do all kinds of other things. But um, and then actually, one of the things that I think is great about it, the museum, is where you guys took that meteorite and actually sliced a little bit off of it, so you could see the the crystalline structure inside. That's really the the sort of litmus test, right, of meteorites is seeing that crystal structure. So, but yeah, that's that. Uh, one quick quick way to, to at least have a better suspicion is it, is it a meteorite is is it magnetic because your average rock is is not going to be magnetic well thank you for sharing that russell and dr cruz did you have anything else you'd like to add um, before we wrap things up um yeah the i was going to say uh the comet itself is actually pretty interesting as i mentioned uh um it um was for, was discovered actually about the same time as uranus was discovered in fact one of the first people to to see the comet was William Herschel was the person who discovered Uranus. Mm -hmm. His wife was also an avid astronomer and she discovered a bunch of stuff too. And she was one of the ones that saw this comet, Comet Inky, um, uh, a few times later. And so she was part one of the major discoverers of this comet. Again, it's the second comet discovered. It's, you know, Halley's Comet we've known about for centuries. Right. This was actually a really big deal at the time. Not only Uranus being discovered, but the second comet. Um, and it's, it's a lot different than Halley, though. Most of the people knew about Halley. It's, it takes like 80 years to go around the sun. And so you'll see it, and it'll be a long time before you see it again. Inky is every three years. It's a much, much faster comet. In fact, it, when it gets its closest point to the sun is about the same distance as Mercury, right? And then it, it gets out um, uh, about to the edge of the asteroid belt, its farthest point. So it's got, it's got a very, again, what they call elliptical orbit. It's not a circle. It's very flattened and oval shaped. Mm -hmm. So it gets all the way out to the asteroid belt uh, and comes in uh, about the same distance as Mercury. So much, much faster comet. You can see it a lot more often. Um, it doesn't get as bright as Halley, which is another reason why it's um, not as famous. Mm -hmm. Um, I was worried about this at first, actually. I thought, oh, oh, you know, we're not talking about the Orionids because they're not from a famous comet. But clearly, at, if I'd lived long enough ago, people would have been saying that this comet from this shower is the most famous comet in the world right now. It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, a very noteworthy object, and historically speaking, uh, as far as astronomy is concerned. One last thing that I want to talk about, and I'm sure Dr. Cruz can uh, 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 fact check this for me. I, 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 I'm under the understanding that um, you know, you've got your iron meteorites, you've got your stony meteorites, and you have your stony iron meteorites. So the last thing we want to do is like dissuade someone you know, that the only way to detect if something is a meteorite is whether or not it's magnetic. That's just the easy way to do it. The scientists are good at discovering whether or not they are, but that's just the easy first test to do it. Yeah. And, and as a matter of fact, iron meteorites are actually rare. Mm -hmm. Most meteorites are stone. Yep. So of course, but the problem is with the stone is it looks like any other stone, right? In fact, that's one of the things that's kind of disappointing sometimes that people say, oh, I've got a meteorite. It's not actually a meteorite, it's just yeah. a stone, right? Just finding a stone in the field doesn't mean it's a meteorite. But on the other hand, there are like amazing stories of scientists racing against the clock to figure out which one of those rocks is the meteorite before it's too late, either because it's going to be stolen or because it's a clay meteorite and like it's made from dirt from the beginning of the solar system, as old as this planet, and it fell where it's going to rain in the next three days, and we have to find it, find it, find it before it's too late. Why this isn't a movie yet, I have no idea. <laughs> Well, us scientists would watch it for sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, how, <laughs> along those lines, do you know where the one of the most common places to find stony me meteorites is? It's actually Antarctica. And the reason is, is because there's no other rocks laying around. So if you find a rock in the middle of an ice field, it's probably a meteorite. Because right? oh very, very rarely is you're just going to have a stone sitting around here. Um, so anyway, that's, that's kind of neat. A um, couple of things I wanted to mention really quickly. I think I hope we have time. Yeah. is that the comet Inky itself is actually fairly small. It's only about five kilometers across. And one of the reasons for that is we think that big chunks of it have broken off over the years, right? Um, in fact, some of you may have heard about there was a, a, an impact in Siberia in the early 1900s, the so-called Tunguska impact. Um, people think that might be actually a fragment of Inky that broke off and created this basically 
it's it's the last big impact that has occurred on the United, in the in the world in the early 1900s. Uh, fortunately, it was in Siberia, and so it didn't just kill a bunch of people or destroy a bunch of buildings. It flattened a bunch of trees. Um, but that's one interesting thing. Um, we actually um, have seen what we think is an impact on the moon from inky debris, right? There, there was actually a, a, an impact that was photographed on the moon. Um, we've seen meteor impacts on mercury from the inky, uh, from inky actually. So it, it, it's getting around. Mm -hmm. Now one, uh, uh, sorry, I meant to mention, there's another fragment that's actually, um, it's called TG10, 2004 TG10. It doesn't have an official name to it. But it's labeled as what they call a PHA, or potentially hazardous asteroid. Oh. It's a chunk about a kilometer across that crosses our orbit. We don't think it's ever going to hit us, but it's definitely one of those that we uh, are keeping track of. It was, it was discovered by the so-called Space Watch program at Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona. As the, 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 the whole mission of this thing is to find asteroids that might hit us in the future. So. You know, it, it's it's a danger. If, if a kilometer wide asteroid were to hit us, we're talking major, major, major destruction. I'm not trying to give anybody a stress attack in the middle of 2020 here. It's not going to hit right, us. Right, right. <laughs> but but it's it's definitely one of those that we're keeping an eye on for you know possibly you know centuries from now. Okay. Plus plus one thing it also does is it helps us get a better idea of how asteroids move through the solar system and get us a better ability to predict it. Uh, one last thing I want to mention is. They actually had a satellite that was designed to go study Inky. Um, it was called, I think it was called the Contour Satellite. It was launched in the early 2000s. And unfortunately, it, it, they got it up into, into space and it, was, and it was doing some maneuvers. Right when they fired the rocket to maneuver it out in, and to go start going toward Inky, it just disappeared. Oh my gosh. So they, they saw some fragments where they where it should be so they think maybe the rocket exploded when it was doing its uh, its burn uh -huh. but my explanation is that there are actually aliens on inky that don't want us to study them <laughs> so they blew up our no i'm, I'm perfectly <laughs> completely so well, uh, thank you. it's inky is a really neat really cool comet of its own right in addition to producing this the, these showers that again they're not there's not a lot of them but man when there's one of them they're really cool well, thank you so much for taking the time to explain this to us and share this knowledge. Um, and I'm excited to go and watch some tourists in the next couple of weeks. And Russell, thank you for joining us as well. I'm delighted to be here. I'm great, great right. to have And definitely come and see Discovery Park of America's Meteorite on display. And then if you have any questions, just let us know. Yep. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.